Court TV gives you a fast-paced weekly look at the most important cases and the most dramatic verdicts captured in America's courtrooms. Verdicts and justice. Whenever the jury finds the defendant guilty, murder is second degree. Learn how judges and jurors reach their verdicts and see for yourself if justice is being served. If you missed an important court decision or want to know what's happened to the people you watched in America's courtrooms, don't miss Verdicts and Justice. Thursday nights at 10, only on Court TV. Court TV is proud to welcome the following new cable systems. Century Berkshire Cable, CVI of Orange County, New York, CVI of Sullivan County, New York. Hello, I'm Arthur Miller, and welcome to another edition of In Context. How many times have we heard someone say, boy, you got away with murder? Well, perhaps no truer words have been spoken than these words in a court of law. In recent years, our criminal justice system has been privy to some of the most creative defenses based on claims of abuse and the effects of various products and physical syndromes. And equally creative arguments have been popping up more and more in recent civil cases. For example, drug companies have been vulnerable to lawsuits brought by a victim's family member, claiming the company should have known that a drug could have harmful side effects that would cause someone taking the drug to harm an innocent bystander. Maybe some of the most noteworthy criminal cases are the Menendez brothers' murder case. Eric and Lyle Menendez claim they killed their parents after years of sexual and emotional abuse. Both of the juries ended up hung. And in the 1979 trial of Dan White, who shot the then mayor of San Francisco and the then county supervisor, White's defense was that he was overcome by severe depression linked to junk food, which included large quantities of Twinkies. Mr. White was found guilty only of manslaughter. And just two weeks ago, Court TV covered the vehicular homicide trial of Gordon House, who had killed three young children and their mother. House claims he was suffering from yes, the effects of a right. migraine right. headache when he collided with a car carrying a family of five. The state says he was intoxicated when the accident occurred. House was convicted. We want to show you a glimpse of what occurred in the courtroom during these well-known trials. First, Gordon House describes what he felt and what he remembered of the night of the accident. Let's take a look at these clips. The uh, migraine headache, uh, as I mentioned, uh, was like a tidal wave. It just came on and it uh, was quite prominent. I was experiencing the, uh, the, uh, the symptoms of the migraine headache. What happened next? Is this warm uh, blood coming down my face? And uh, hearing a lot of people shouting, yelling. Uh, was in shock, uh, pain. There's a lot of things that were occurring. Did you know what had happened? Uh, no. I remember the first time he raped me. I remember when, when he told me about the syringes going through my bones and I was going to die. I remember the put downs that he told me. There was just so many pictures on my head. And there were just... There were just pictures there in my head. I remember the insults and the bad words that he told me. I remember every time that he had, had himself, had sex with me. He hurt me. I remember everything. Everything. I remember when he told me 
me about the abortion. I remember everything. Do you remember cutting him? No, I don't remember that. Why did you kill your parents? Because we were afraid. Do you have a lot of nice memories from your childhood? No. Between the ages of six and eight, did your father have sexual contact with you? Yes. To help us better understand syndrome abuse, or what's commonly referred to as the abuse excuse, here in the studio we have Janine Pirro. Ms. Pirro is the district attorney of Westchester County, whose office prosecuted Paul Cox. Mr. Cox was charged with the murder of two doctors. His defense, he was delusional at the time of the killings because he was under the influence of alcohol. We'll ask Ms. Pirro about the outcome of that case. Second, George Fletcher. Mr. Fletcher is a professor of law at Columbia University who is the author of a book called With Justice for Some. This book explores some of the cases we've just mentioned. Dr. Frederick Rogers. Dr. Rogers is an assistant research professor for the Center of Alcohol Studies at Rutgers University. Dr. Rogers has testified in many death penalty cases involving alcohol and childhood abuse. Last, down in our newsroom, is Mickey Sherman. Mickey is a fine criminal defense attorney who successfully defended a Vietnam veteran charged with manslaughter. His defense, post-traumatic stress disorder. We'll talk to Mickey about that case, too. But first, George, help us out. What are we talking about here? It seems like such an, a crazy array of what some people call designer defenses. <laughs> well, that's a good term for it because, in fact, there are many different cuts that seem to fit under one general pattern. And the general argument is that the defendant is not personally to blame for what appears to be an obvious criminal act. So in the Menendez brothers case, it's obvious that they've committed a criminal act and they argue that there's some basis for reducing the blame that is properly la laid to their charge. Uh, the argument is really not simply abuse. The argument is a curious doctrine in, in California that they acted in good faith self-defense. And the abuse argument just came in as a way of supporting their good faith belief that their parents were about to kill them. I think that it'd be, well, the use of the abuse uh, material there was total nonsense. Mm -hmm. and You're I think a that, doubter about some of this stuff. Oh, yes. I think it's, it's utter nonsense. But I think that it's also important to point out that uh, the, uh, the journalists take these claims much more seriously than juries do. <laughs> that, in fact, uh, juries are, have a, a good deal of common sense, and they can see through these arguments very effectively. And as I argue in my book, when this argument succeeds, it is likely to succeed because the victim is depreciated in the minds of the jury. Not simply, it's not simply that the, the Twinkie defense helped Dan White get convicted of manslaughter. Without the implicitly homophobic arguments about Harvey Milk, I don't think that the defense would have succeeded. And that's precisely what angered the gay community in San Francisco. Uh, Fred, how different is all of this from classic criminal defenses like insanity or diminished capacity? Well, I, th I think that uh, the syndrome defense is related to both of those defenses mm -hmm. and, and probably an attempt to uh, expand uh, both of those defenses. But I think we uh, need, at least from the perspective of a psychologist, to differentiate between uh, a syndrome, which could be the presence of any mental illness, um, and the person's state of mind and capabilities at the time of the offense. And I think that's where uh, syndrome defenses, uh, such as a, a having been abused as a child, uh, made me do it, do something 20 years later, uh, may not really hold water unless you can link that uh, syndrome much more closely to the actual offense. Let me mean, ask you this. I mean, it, it classically, the argument of, of diminished capacity or insanity was based upon a diagnosis of mental illness. And these new syndrome arguments, post-traumatic stress or what have you, are based upon a general pattern of behavior and some experience that the defendant has had that supposedly reduces 
personal responsibility for the act. It's not mental illness, but it is some kind of experience that seems to make a difference. Well, actually, post-traumatic stress disorder is a, a psychiatric diagnosis, and many would of the... Would you call it a mental illness? Would it well, it, 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 what about it, it, it is about a migraine? The migraine may be clearly me not a mental illness or a mental disease. Or black rage. Which was well, used now, in you know, Black Rage is a very interesting example yes. because no one ever took this <laughs> seriously right. except <laughs> Kunstler in the newspapers. I mean, th this was I mean total nonsense from the beginning. Not even Colin Ferguson wanted to take it seriously, right? But it makes a big splash yeah. uh, in the media, and I think that's one of the reasons why lawyers love to make these arguments because they get attention. Uh, Mickey, <laughs> Mickey, they're <laughs> talking about you. Yeah, I, 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 uh, actually, I, I really agree with George because one of the things that George says, which really bears repeating is the fact that these are not technicalities that we get people off on like a, a bad search warrant or something. These are defenses which when we use them and we use them effectively are only validated when a jury of our clients peers, uh, assuming they're peers, accepts them. It's sure. not something that we put over on anybody. Unless the community buys into this or that small portion that we put on the jury, it ain't going to fly. But you know, Mickey, there is a lot less pressure on a defense attorney to prove to a jury uh, in, a, in a syndrome case that the defendant is suffering from some kind of mental disease or defect. It's a lot easier to say to essentially place the blame on the victim, on society, on too much sugar, too many Twinkies. I mean, you don't have to establish the level of sophistication in terms of testimony in a, in a syndrome case that you do in a, an insanity defense. Also, the major problem, of course, is that you can get an expert witness uh, to argue on behalf of the existence of this syndrome. And typically, as in the battered women's cases, uh, the expert witness has never examined the suspect, doesn't know anything about the personal qualities and characteristics of the suspect, but just comes into court to speak generally about the so-called syndrome of this sort or of that sort. And then the jury has to make the application of that general principle to the suspect. Mickey, Mickey we have very nice guests here. What they're <laughs> saying to you is that you're pandering to junk science and you're trying to put the wool over jury's eyes and then you say well the jury did it i didn't do it well i i have a little more faith in the jury system that they're going to just believe any garbage that i or any other defense attorney throws out there i think there's got to be some credibility that we show to them with documentation evidence psychiatric evidence and, and testimonial evidence i don't think they're just going to buy it because i come up with a, a very good eloquent doctor but i give more credit than that but essentially mickey what it is is it's a form of jury nullification if a jury is sympathetic to the defendant and the jury sees the defendant every day the jury doesn't see the victim the jury has forgotten the victim and in that case it's easy to sell the fact that maybe the victim wasn't so wonderful and look yeah. at this wonderful human being in the courtroom that doesn't rise to the level of a science or expert testimony what it does is you're touching the empathies of the jury I, I have to agree with you Jenny. It, it makes a big difference on the type of victim you have and the conduct you can show that the victim and that the victim not the defendant but the victim engaged in is that right or wrong I, I can't make that judgment. Sure. But these right. defenses will not fly when, unless you have a worthy victim as such. You mean, uh, you mean a good victim for purposes of attacking the victim? Yes. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Worthy of attack. I, I, I need a scientific judgment. Yes. yes. Fred, how many syndromes are there out there? Um, there are probably as many syndromes as there are uh, semi-qualified experts who are willing to testify. Ooh, to that's that. a lot of syndromes. <laughs> yes, um, and unfortunately, what George says is, is said previously is all too often the case that uh, it's possible to find. Uh, experts who will, will testify to almost anything and I think that's a that's a problem uh, with the with the experts themselves um, in the cases that I've been involved in I try to link what I'm saying to something that I can demonstrate from the scientific literature uh, if called upon to do so that's not always possible with a lot of the syndrome defenses but it is true that when you testify you don't have to talk about the particular defendant you can oh, talk no, about that's the syndrome in general. I, uh, well, I, uh, I certainly never testify in, in that regard. I examine the... Def the uh -huh. You always the, do. The, the, All right. Always. Let, let's always. not get too defensive at that yes, end of absolutely. the table. Absolutely. <laughs> it's time, time for a break. We'll be back. We'll be talking about the strategy of defense and prosecution in cases involving syndromes. Keep in mind, we want to hear from you. Later on in the program, we'll be taking your phone calls. Hang in there. We'll be right back. Abuse excuse? Wow, I really don't know what that is. <laughs> I'm not familiar with the term, but I would think it's a cop-out. Basically, somebody's using uh, the excuse that 
because they were a victim or uh, because of something completely external to the crime, uh, it gets them away from personal responsibility for a criminal act. My philosophy in life is to take responsibility for your own actions, so I don't really buy that at all. My dad has been my dentist since my first tooth has come in. This is the first toothpaste that he's ever sent me. This is Tartar Control Mentadent with fluoride, baking soda, and peroxide. Mentadent helps stop tartar before it forms. Tartar Control Mentadent. It has everything. From Eureka, back so powerful they've earned the Corvette name. Corvette Handback with powered brush roll. New Corvette Wet Dry with high performance four horsepower motor. Both great deals. The next generation from Eureka. When you're outside and you want bugs gone Now there's an off that you don't put on Now there's an off that starts with a light So you can enjoy a delightful night hey, hey. New off citronella candles with a unique country fresh scent They're the bright new way to keep bugs away Just light them to let them do the rest When you want bugs as good as gone Try the new off that you don't put on New off citronella candles, S.C. Johnson Wax Relationships, making them last. Hmm, perhaps some other time. I want to know. I want to know more about. The best way to keep fit. Oh, that's another commercial. I want to know more about Rogaine. Rogaine with minoxidil? Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay, just call this number now for a free information kit on Rogaine Topical Solution. It could help answer your questions because it's filled with all kinds of facts about Rogaine. And because you need a prescription for Rogaine, we'll send you a list of local doctors and special money-saving offers to help you find out if Rogaine's right for you. But I want to know right now. We'll mail it to you today. So what are you waiting for? Call now for your free information kit. Call 1-800-253-8883. This violence, ladies and gentlemen, the evidence will show, was characterized by brutality, which included things such as rape, beatings, kickings, punching, shoving, slapping, dragging, choking, and threats of more violence. The evidence will show that in her mind, it was his penis from which she could not escape which caused her the most pain, the most fear, the most humiliation. And I submit to you that at the end of this case, you will come to one conclusion, and that is that a life is more valuable than a penis. Janine, throughout <laughs> that little excerpt, you, you were almost rabid with rage. <laughs> Well, you know, as a prosecutor, I mean, we hear this all the time. We hear defense attorneys blaming the victim for uh, a crime that a uh, defendant has committed. And what they're doing, and what she was doing very well, was blaming the defendant's penis and the defendant for what, uh, or the victim's penis and the, uh, for what the defendant ended up doing. And it's just backwards. It's putting the focus on the uh, uh, victim as the bad guy and uh, placing an incredible onus on the prosecution to try to overcome that. Mickey, when yeah. do you decide to use the, these excuses? Well, uh, unlike uh, what most people probably think is that we go to a book and we thumb through it and wherever our finger stops, we're going to go with that one. It really doesn't work that way. You really have to have a basis, a good faith basis and a logical and rational basis for what you're doing. And unless your client was in Vietnam or unless they suffered from this or suffered from these particular symptoms or demonstrated these manifestations, it's not going to work. And we just don't... You know, invent well, one. Well, well, tell us about the case, the celebrated case that you did succeed with. What was unique about it? What made that one a winner? Well, I won. I'm just kidding. That's, that was not unique. Uh, the fact uh, of Roger's case w was, uh, again, I will confess to you that we had a very, as we would say, worthy victim. He was not a, a very likable person, had a long criminal record, had a violent history. And our defense was that uh, Roger 
took out a gun and essentially executed him because the man refused to move his car from a parking space and then said, I'm coming back to get you with my boys, you're a dead man. He wasn't armed, my client Roger did have a gun legitimately and, and killed him. And it turns out that about 25 years to that very date, Roger had been through some very, very extreme circumstances in Vietnam, well documented, and it suffered from the classic textbook from right from DSM-3, uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Do you know, do you know why that's too easy, Mickey? That's too easy because there are a lot of people who 25 years ago were in war or in a stressful situation who don't turn around and that's kill right. someone. And that's because and some people are stronger than others. Let me just and that's exactly today. what the jury found. The some argument was self-defense, I take it. I mean, you're Actually, not it was a dual argument. One was self-defense, which the jury didn't buy. Yes. They didn't buy that. Right. They rejected what was the other argument? They uh, was... Uh, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, that's not an argument. There's no Mental instruction. Disease. You don't get an instruction no. in the law called post-traumatic stress. You have to relate it to one of the traditional defenses. Insanity. Insanity. It's insanity defense. Well, you so mentioned this and argue that it's a mental illness or mental defense. Disease mental disease or defense. Disease. I see. I see. Well, if you see this, the self-defense case is, uh, argument is also appealing because you can make a fairly sound claim, I think, that if you're going to look at the behavior of a reasonable person under the circumstances, you've got to include the personal characteristics of this person, Roger. His baggage. He came there that's with his right. baggage. I think that's a perfectly reasonable argument, Thank and I, th you. I think it's wrong to uh, attack that kind of individualization in the criminal law, which I think is sensible, simply because there are many cases in which the argument goes awry. I'm, I'm buying Fred, George's book, by the way, okay? Could you? Yes, George is selling the book <laughs> uh, on the street after the show. Well, I'm Fred, buying one. Yeah, George, I agree with you 100%. I think what, the, if we need to look at each case on its individual merits and to make sure that, that uh, the defendant uh, really does qualify for a, a legitimate diagnosis, and the, the better documented that diagnosis mm -hmm. is by sources outside of the, the, the proceeding itself, the better. Uh, I, many times when I work with attorneys and evaluate a client, I'll give the attorney my, my report and you know, say, there's, there's just nothing here. You know, the attorney may have thought, because the person had uh, a few drinks before they mm -hmm. uh, committed a crime, that uh, there, there was a diminished capacity defense there. But uh, that's, that's not always the case. It really has to be uh, quite extreme and, and unique uh, even to that, to that individual. Janine, how do you deal mm -hmm. with this? Well, first of all, you hope and pray. I mean, because there is no question that juries in this country are changing. Whenever someone kills, the issue used to be, did he do it? Did she do it? Was it intentional murder? And that was the end of it. And the, left, the rest was left up to the judge for sentencing. Now the issue is, if the person did kill, why did they kill? Where did we go wrong? Was the victim worthy of being killed? Should the victim have been killed? And did the right person kill her? or him. And so what we've got to do is make sure that we've got expert testimony to contradict the uh, defense testimony and to make sure that we establish that there truly is no objective criteria to determine these syndromes. Yes. There truly isn't. Well, that's, 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 no, that's true. Yeah, but notice defense. the area in which victims have fought back. I think it's extremely illuminating. The one area... If the victim's alive. No, no. Yeah, of course. When the victim's alive, and in the most dramatic uh, context is rape. Mm -hmm. Because there, women have organized it, uh, rape, uh, and the reform of rape law has become a feminist crusade. And in that contest, it would be scandalous for a defense lawyer to refer, as Mickey did, to a worthy victim, someone you could attack easily because Wait of a, a loose sexual Wait background. A minute. Defense attorneys do that all the they time. They do it all the time. They and do indeed, it all that's, the time. And my view is, I agree. Juries buy into my it. My view is that that's where they learn to do it. In fact, that is the the place in which defense counsel have been schooled traditionally right. in attacking right. the victim. The but. We have now rape shield statutes that right. prevent that kind of shaming of the victim in court. And what we don't have is a similar movement in homicide cases. That's right. What we don't have, and I, and I think you and, and I agree completely on that. And you know what the problem with that is? The problem is the defendant can come in and say anything. That's make right. anything up, That's right. the victim can't respond. Exactly. Let's talk about uh, Robert Chambers, the, the, the rough sex right. defense. What does that mean, rough sex? And this alleged sex diary, which was her day in, a date calendar. Isn't there a backlash? Yeah, I, I would think so. that there is. I, I keep oh, hearing yeah. more and more so. people right. Right. outraged. Yes, sure. but sure. you know what? It's talk television where everyone is totally glued to people getting on TV and weeping about why they committed the horrible crimes that they did or the, why they do the horrible things they do. We're too understanding. We take this responsibility of the criminal onto ourselves and say, where did we go wrong? Well, I think that there was a watershed that was reached, and, and as one 
writer put it, it happened when Lyle reloaded his gun. I mean, I think at that point, yeah, the country party that, George. Well, I think that there was a tendency up until the Menendez case to take this kind of uh, popular psychology, sympathy for the abused child, seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think after the hung juries in the Menendez case, there's been a serious turnaround in our society. And you will see that the Menendez boys will be convicted the second time. The judge will be much, much tougher on the use of this uh, alleged history of sexual abuse. And there will be a change in the jury, mood of the juries in this country. Now, now Mickey, what uh, George is describing uh, is to take one of your toys away. I, I, I frankly agree. I, th I agree with George. I think that's probably <laughs> going to be the offshoot. I, I wouldn't say it's a toy. I just think that people are going to be a lot less responsive and not less sympathetic because they feel that it's a sham out there. And of course, I think that was the end result of the Twinkie defense. But for every successful Twinkie defense, and there's not a lot of them, there's uh, scores of defenses which are probably legit legitimate but just don't fly. You know, so we're, you're, I think you're really looking at the exceptions. Unfortunately, they're very visible exceptions. Dr. Fred, if you wanted to define a core of legitimacy, what would you say? Well, I think if, if you look at, at the, the two defenses that are actually enshrined in statute, an insanity defense and a diminished capacity defense, both of, both of those defenses talk about a person's mental state at the time, and they require significant changes in cognitive functioning as a result of some process. Okay, it can't just be, you know, I was having a bad day. You, you have to really be able to demonstrate that uh, not only were you having a bad day, but you couldn't think straight, and you really couldn't think straight, and you have to be able to prove to a, to a jury, because they are affirmative uh, defenses, that, that that condition existed. Um, and I think that, that that's what lends the core of, of th that's the legitimate position. When you talk about syndrome, uh, testimony, uh, what you're getting into are kind of very remote effects that people are using to explain their behavior sometimes years later and uh, you know, I'm not sure that that really flies in, in, in you know, legitimate psychology and psychiatry. It's time for another break. When we return we'll talk about the judicial system and how it handles these syndromes. For example, is a drug company that manufactures Prozac uh, responsible if a Prozac user murders someone? Stay with us. Sure, I have secrets. Of course, some are juicier than others. Like my secret for onion burgers. Lipton Recipe Secrets Onion. A delicious blend of toasted onion and seasonings. Lipton Recipe Secrets. I'm a better cook with it than without it. Look at my kids. They're experts at making all kinds of stains. Pizza, mustard, grass. Their dirty shirts will show you why Clorox 2 is the only color safe bleach I'd use. Clorox 2 has special stain fighting enzymes that lift stains, plus more brighteners than other color safe bleaches to keep colors brighter. Because I want my family's clothes looking their best every time, I use Clorox 2. It's tough on stains, easy on colors. I knew I had it in me. There was a slim, sexy woman inside me dying to come out. And here she is. I lost 31 pounds in just six weeks with CyberTrim. CyberTrim is the total diet and exercise program from Cybergenics designed for healthy toning and slimming. And it's 100% satisfaction guaranteed. So reveal the woman you really are. I know you have it in you. CyberTrim from Cybergenics. The Boss Excalibur by Eureka. Legendary boss power. Two motors for carpets, bare floors. Seven stage filtration, traps, dust, and pollen. And instant suction above floor. Low boss price. And Excalibur with quiet clean. From Eureka. Want an easier way to get rid of soap scum? Better call your RainSoft water treatment dealer today. like the society is drifting toward uh, blaming everything except the individual. We've gone too far 
because the lawyer is trying to find a way to get the clients off, of, off the, get the clients uh, from not being guilty. So they try every means to prove that it was under the influence of drugs or something else. It wasn't a stable mind doing that, committing the crime. It's crazy. I mean, if you have money and if the case becomes explosive, you know what I mean, in the, in, in the media, you know, it becomes like this, this like television issue. Everyone's just watching it, like, like for amusement. You know what I mean? It, it, it defeats like the purpose of the judicial system. There's so many loopholes in the system. I think it allows the system allows itself to be abused. You know what was interesting about several of those remarks? They were worried about the system. Mm -hmm. Abuse of the system, smart it defeats people. Yeah. the system. They are smart people because well, the public has lost confidence in the criminal justice system. These people speak to the issue that we as prosecutors worry about every day. And that is the fact that, you know, if people don't believe in the system, how are we going to get them to believe in our case? Well, yeah, people, it's deeper than that. I mean, the public, okay. has, the public has lost confidence in government generally, and the legal system is simply the front line of government. Don't we get and, the legal system we deserve? Well, Did somebody once say that? Yeah, but I also, that may be true. I hope not. We do get the legal system we deserve, and it probably is much better than most people think. Exactly. Because, yes. in fact, we do get a tremendous amount of pleasure out of complaining about it and saying that this is awful and it's going to the dogs. And that's why we love to find one, you know, high-profile case that, like the Bobbitt case, that's right. that We're seems to go awry. We're on a peak right now with the O.J. Oh, it couldn't be better, right? right? I mean, my right. God, there'll be a hung jury, and this means that justice is over in America. I mean, that's <laughs> ridiculous. Is, realistically. <laughs> Is the creation, the development, this is a modern, recent phenomenon, these designer defenses, is it really damaging the system? Or are we just worrying about something? After all, George, you, you've said many times that the number of successes is very few. That's right. I think that the coping with the problem is sometimes worse than the problem itself. The cure is worse than the disease because, for example, what California did after the Dan White case is they abolished the defense of diminished responsibility. That was a mistake. I mean, there's no reason to abolish the entire defense of diminished responsibility simply because the defense was misused and misapplied in that case. It would have been much more intelligent to take a limited measure of reform like limiting the competence of psychiatrists in their testimony honing it back, saying you can only testify about these practical, concrete questions, not about things beyond your competence. That would be okay. Let, let's focus on that, and I'll point my finger right at you, Fred. Expert testimony. Yes. You know, you know the, the cynical cliche is, give me the money and I'll go buy an expert to testify on anything, and that is said to contribute to these defenses. How do, we, how do we purify the legal system's use of experts when, when there are people out there who will testify to anything? I'm, I'm not sure how to, to purify the system uh, entirely, but I think that one way to uh, alleviate some of the, the junk science, if you will, is to uh, have the experts be friends of the court rather than parties to uh, one side or the other. Um, th that, that's not obviously going to solve the problem uh, entirely because uh, obviously both sides will, one or, one or the other side will probably be unhappy with what the court appointed expert says. Well, doesn't that give them too much uh, credit? I mean, if you have a court appointed expert, that's uh, to say that expert testimony is the objective truth. We don't really believe that. Well, I think that, that expert testimony, when it's, when it's given in a uh, scientifically based and uh, you know, well-informed fashion um, really does, to some extent, help the jury understand what what went on. But in but, but don't both sides say that they do just that? And then isn't it a question of who the jury wants to believe? Well, I think so. No, and, no. And, and whether they want to believe them at all. Sure. At all. Look sure. at the right. Jeffrey Dahmer case. They had experts who testified that this man was insane, which exactly wasn't a stretch given the man was eating <laughs> body parts. <laughs> <from the TV>. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> Yet. Even with the experts, even with everything else, the jury said, hey, it. he's not insane. Right. Yeah. But yeah. you know, that's interesting, Mickey, in terms of the insanity defense. I think that fewer people are using the insanity defense now because, number one, there is a certain uh, objective criteria in terms of mental disease or defect. And number two, with the insanity defense, you might end up spending more time committed than you would had you been convicted on the uh, right. uh, underlying it, it, crime. Absolutely right. That's I, why these yeah. syndromes have come in, because they're yeah, so much um, easier. Yeah. Let, let me twist the conversation just a little bit. Up to now, we've really focused on criminal cases. Mm -hmm. But there is this parallel phenomenon out there of people on a drug, a prescription drug, or an alcohol, or whatever, uh, hurting somebody. 
an innocent third person in an auto accident or a gun discharge, and then you get a civil lawsuit for damages against the manufacturer. Are we carrying that too far? No, I don't think so. I think this is a very plausible uh, basis for a civil uh, lawsuit. It, the, if a drug is defective in its tendency to produce violent action uh, and there is a, a high statistical correlation between the use of the drug and a violent response, then it is no different from a drug that causes cancer uh, in the patient or in the offspring of the person who took the drug and there is the civil liability for causing cancer in the daughters of the women who took DES, so, for example. So you're not worried about the domino effect well, of I think, a look, cascading if, if, lawsuits? No, I think that what we're going to see now in the area of gun control is the use of this technique against gun manufacturers. And I think this is a sensible way of using the tort system to achieve uh, regulation in areas where the government is not willing to act. You're assuming that the current Congress will leave a tort system. I would think so. <laughs> well, I think, no, I, this, one thing is clear is that the current Congress is not going to move aggressively in the area of gun control. And if there's going to be some kind of legal response to uh, the casual production and distribution and sale of weapons, one way to uh, one kind of reaction is through the tort system. It makes a lot of sense. But what, what about a less dramatic case su such as Prozac, where people mm -hmm. are claiming that, that uh, Prozac made them do it? Yes. Um, what sort of standard would you hold uh, Eli Lilly to uh, in, in defending Prozac? They can't have done all of the right. studies of every possible contingency, uh, and in fact, weren't required to. Um, the how problem, they the problem is that if there's a low, there must be a low, a very low statistical correlation. Yes. And in that case, it's difficult to establish a strong causal connection between the taking of the drug and the violent response, okay. right? But i will give you an, an easy case would be a case in which, you, let's say, you sell a drink to someone who's obviously drunk, and then the person who's drunk has an automobile accident. There's That's plenty an easy of precedent yes. for right. that kind That's of right. In that kind of case, yes. Time for break. When we return, it'll be time for your phone call. How do you feel about these designer defenses? You think there's some validity, or is the system getting out of control? The number here, 212-557-1301. Give us a call. We'd like to hear from you. There is no creditable scientific evidence that Prozac causes in anyone suicidal behavior or violent behavior. Joseph Westbecker, after he shot and murdered these people, committed suicide himself. But our claim in this case isn't that Prozac caused Joseph Westbecker to just commit suicide. Our claim here is that Joseph West, that Prozac caused Joseph Westbecker to injure them, cause violent, aggressive, homicidal behavior. Court TV is proud to welcome the following new cable systems. TKR of Greater Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. Gold Coast Cable Vision, North Bay Village, Florida. There you are, careening through the Manhattan skyline in an attempt to repel the invasion of the savage Keshron. When suddenly, little Susie comes in wanting to visit the Bear Country Fair. So, you pop in Berenstain Bears, and voila, you and Susie are learning to be responsible so you can take a shot at little Freddy. When Billy arrives, needing to research the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. So in goes Compton's Encyclopedia, and you all take a time machine back to the reign of Marcus Aurelius. It's education, games, music and movies. It's CDI, interactive entertainment for your living room in one handy unit. Plug it in. Play it now. It even plays movies like Forrest Gump. CD for your TV. Call now to find out how you can get Compton's interactive encyclopedia, Space Ace, and the furiously fun new title, Chaos Control. All three worth $180 free when you buy CDI during this limited time offer. Call now for information. I'm George Kennedy for Breath Assure. Here at the Beverly Hills Country Club, people love good food flavored with garlic, onions, and spices. Me, I eat what I want because I have the revolutionary solution. Breath Assure, the internal breath freshener. 
Breath Assure works from the inside, where bad breath often starts. My breath had always been so offensive. It was like, wow, did you just brush your teeth? No, I didn't. I found my miracle product. Breath Assure has made our relationship a lot better. Breath Assure is long lasting. I swallow a few powerful capsules, and I have clean breath for hours and hours. I never forget my Breath Assure. To order Breath Assure, call 800-537-8900. Four dispensers for only $19.95. That's 200 long-lasting capsules. Plus, if you call within the next 30 minutes, you'll also get 10 single-use packs absolutely free with your order. Call 800-537-8900. Guaranteed or your money back. Order now, 800-537-8900. When the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution, they made sure that trials in the bold new experiment called America would be public. So courtrooms were built with large audience galleries, and people watched the debates that transfixed the community. She may not die. She may end up a vegetable. Courts haven't changed, and neither has our desire to witness these events firsthand. Court TV, an idea as old as America. For the latest verdicts and information from the trials covered on Court TV, you're invited to call the Court TV verdict line at 1-800-COURT-56. We're going right to the telephones. Fawn from New Paul's, New York. Good evening. Good evening. What can we do for you? Well, I just wanted to um, briefly disagree with a point that was made about suing uh, manufacturers. Yes. I think that those kind of cases could be taken to the point where you would actually see like the manufacturer of cars sued um, because they make cars that go over 65 miles an hour. Why would we need a car that goes that fast? You're worried about line drawing. Well, yeah. well George is actually a torts <laughs> professor as well as a uh, criminal law professor. That's why we have courts and juries to figure out these um, delicate questions. Obviously, you don't sue all uh, manufacturers for all automobile accidents, but there are cases of a defective car where it is appropriate uh, to sue, and it's also appropriate to sue when the seller uh, puts a dangerous object in the hands of someone who is obviously not responsible and can't use it right. But, you know, I think what the caller is talking about is the fact that, you know, if someone's on Prozac and then decides to sue the company that, that makes Prozac, what about the eight million other people who are on Prozac? Who are doesn't being it helped make it, by it. Who are of being course. helped of by it, but doesn't it make it, uh, you know, less substantive in Absolutely. terms of a lawsuit? Absolutely. We're so litigious. I agree. No, I agree. I think that goes into the question where there really is a defect. I mean, if there's one problem in 10,000 cases, it's not defective. All right, let's talk to Tim from Pittsburgh. How are you doing tonight, Arthur? Well, uh, we're fine. Tim, how are you tonight? Good. I got a question from Mickey Sherman. Uh, he's all ears. Shoot. How are you doing tonight, Nick? Good. Yeah, you're about one of my favorite defense attorneys in the whole world. Good. Hey, get arrested with oh, me. stop this love <laughs> thing. Get on with it, Tim. Uh, no, hey, I, I got a question for you. Uh, first of all, what do you think of the Menendez brothers? I mean, do you buy their defense excuse? No, no. Well, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm, the, I'm the, the defense shill for the evening. <laughs> and I guess I, I'm supposed to, but I, got, I think it's bogus. I'm sorry, I don't buy into it. Good. He's a smart I mean, uh, yes. well, I mean what, was she's filling out their college application in a sloppy manner, and that's why they killed my... I, I don't buy it. All right, time for another break. The number again, we'll be taking more calls, is 212-557-1301. Give us a call. Hello, folks. William Shallard here for Globe Life Insurance. You know, many of us need additional life insurance, but deciding which policy to buy can be a confusing process. Well, Globe's long life policy is designed to provide the extra coverage many of us need, and it's simple and easy to understand. The long life policy features a level $10,000 benefit that's available from the very first day the policy is issued. It only costs $1 to start a long life policy. $1 covers the premium for the first month. This lets you review the policy. If you're not satisfied, return the policy for a complete refund. And finally, applying for coverage is easy. No physical exams, just answer a few health questions. Globe makes buying life insurance that simple. So call Globe today. To receive complete information and applications by return mail, Call Globe at 1-800-531-2400. Call Globe today. Watch what happens to these scratches and swirl marks. 
New Advanced Formula Color Magic Car Polish from Turtle Wax contains more colorants to help hide minor scratches and swirl marks better than ever, while giving your car 12 months of unsurpassed Turtle Wax protection against the elements. Even on old neglected finishes, Advanced Formula Color Magic works like magic, bringing back the color and shine. Hide scratches and swirl marks better than ever with new Advanced Formula Turtle Wax Color Magic. Rich Chocolate Ovaltine versus Nestle Quick. Yeah, I really was surprised it was Ovaltine. I'm really surprised because I thought that Ovaltine was a malted flavor strictly. I really didn't think there was a rich chocolate flavor. That, it was pretty chocolatey. Rich Chocolate Ovaltine is a different kind of Ovaltine, and its great taste will surprise you. Rich Chocolate Ovaltine has vitamins and minerals. Quick does not have that. I think Ovaltine would definitely be better. It has that rich chocolate flavor. I think I'm definitely going to change. Rich Chocolate Ovaltine. Back to the phones, Kevin in Chicago, Illinois. Good evening. Hi. Uh, my question is with respect to the abuse excuse. And the question is, if the government gets to decide if it's justified for a defendant to die via the death penalty, then why can't it be this, the same be said for an alleged victim by a jury? Why can't a jury say that he or she deserved to die? It's a, good, it's a great question. Yeah. And uh, I think it captures the, the contradiction in Mickey's reference here to uh, worthy victims. Uh, when the government decides that someone deserves to die, that's always on the basis of specific conduct announced in advance. That's what we mean by the rule of law. Now, when the jury comes in and says, this victim deserved to die because, uh, let's say, Jose Menendez, because he has allegedly abused his child over years and therefore he deserved to die, they are taking the law into their own hands. That is contrary to the rule of law. They are acting as judge, jury, executioner, police, all in one, and that's clearly against our values. And, and basically what that is, is it's vigilantism. It's yes. giving people the ability uh, to go out and kill and then explain to a jury, well, this person really deserved to die. And, you know, without the, without the law, without any rules, and, you know, a jury putting its imprimatur on it. Yeah, the thing in the Menendez case that I will never comprehend is they killed the mother, too. And right. the mother and was they, guilty of nothing. And they reloaded. They went outside, they reloaded, reloaded yeah. and shot her again. Uh, Mickey, do you ever worry about the victims? Oh, 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 totally, and, and I'm, I'm glad you, you came back to me because the last thing I want to uh, do tonight is leave anyone with the impression that anyone is worthy of being killed. That, that's not what I meant. Right. Bad choice of words on my part. What I meant is that and the Menendez case is a good example. The jury might be able to say that Jose Menendez, was, there was some rational basis why they would have such animosity. And therefore, when he, they could justify the, the violence against him, but they could never justify it against her. And by that I meant worthy, not in truth worthy and not deserving of death. No victim, certainly not in the case that I handled, is ever deserving of that. And I don't mean anyone to have that impression. Let's talk to Walter in New York. Walter? Yes, hi. I just wanted to make a general comment in regards to PTSD. Somehow I think that uh, some people are referring to, uh, to it as sort of a, a new age psychobabble. And it's something that goes back, uh, goes back uh, as far as the Civil War. It used to be referred to as soldier's heart. It used to be referred to as shell shock and uh, combat fatigue. And if everybody remembers that famous scene with George C. Scott slaps a soldier in Patton, that uh, individual there was supposed to have uh, uh, battle fatigue. So uh, I, I sort of see Miss Miss Pirro. Uh, I, I almost see Miss Pirro in the, in the role of George C. Scott saying, uh, "Snap out of it." Uh, she shouldn't do that, you know. Right. Right. Watch it, Walter. Right. She's right. going right. to slap you. Walter, she never slapped me. But, but you know what, Walter? There's no question. There are some syndromes that, uh, for which there is a good basis, for which there is a real problem, and the law permits that. What I would, you know, I would tell someone who's who's asserting the Twinkie defense to snap out of it. No question about. It. How far are we going to take it? That's what my problem well, is. Well, I think the language has done, a great, done us a great service by adding this phrase, give me a break. You know, and this is what we say <laughs> when people make these ridiculous arguments. Fred? <laughs> but, the, but the law doesn't al allow for a break except if there's a, a legitimate reason for the person to get a break. But yeah. when the and law doesn't allow for it, the jury has its nullification powers yeah. and does it under the guise of a syndrome. And, and, and that really is uh, where the syndrome defense uh, See, creates right. problems is when you have a, a very persuasive defense lawyer who can get the jury to override uh, clear scientific testimony. Right. Right. But you still right. need a jury to, to override them. You still need a jury that's going to buy it and believe it. 
And, and I think the mood that's of the public right. is very much against right. that. I mean, that's uh, right. as, as the great uh, jurist Don Henley says, get over it. And yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right. G George Coates, Mickey, you know, we're going to get over you and go to Walter in Jacksonville, Florida. Okay. Walter? Uh, uh, that's Jeff. Oh, that's Jeff. I'm sorry, Jeff. Yeah, I, I was... Uh, I just had a comment about the uh, product liability cases of, as it relates to like Prozac, guns, alcohol. Isn't it by taking away the personal responsibility, eliminating that factor, just another form of the insanity defense? I think I understand the question. I think it, it's true that these claims are based upon the assumption that the person who acquires the product and then behaves violently is not acting with response to full responsibility. That's true. And I think that the tendency to expand liability is based upon the same uh, pattern, same syndrome, if you will, that we've been talking about, namely the denial of personal responsibility on the part of individuals. And I think the criticism is well taken. Excuse. That's right. That's right. I think that if you see if you see each person who behaves violently is fully responsible for what he or she is doing, then you could never hold the gun manufacturer or the Prozac manufacturer responsible. Let's talk to Guido here in New York City. Guido? Yes, I'd like to direct this question to Dr. Rogers yes. concerning post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm confused on his answer to it. Is it a mental disorder? Is it a psychological disorder? Is it emotional disorder? And what's the difference in this disorder? How does that work? Well, it's, it's, it's a, a mental disorder in the sense that it's, that it's part of the diagnostic uh, manual of the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, there are all different kinds of mental disorders uh, that have uh, different ramifications for a person's being, being responsible for their behavior. But it, but it is a mental disorder. Uh, traditionally in court, only the more severe mental disorders have typically been uh, thought to uh, be, be the basis for an insanity or diminished capacity defense. Uh, some courts uh, in New Jersey, for example, have expanded that. Um, and have allowed for other types of cognitive uh, problems that aren't necessarily mental disorders to form the basis for diminished capacity. Now, you will admit that all of this language of mental disorder syndrome, all of this was created primarily to understand behavior, behavior and provide therapy. Oh, absolutely. It wasn't designed to judge questions of guilt and innocence in courtrooms. That's right, but I still think that uh, allowing a jury to understand a legitimate disorder may help them in assigning responsi level of responsibility. And it's created by psychiatrists, too. Mm -hmm. yeah, let's not forget that. Not by lawyers, by psychiatrists. Yes, mm -hmm. and then we get to the more fundamental question, which is whether or not the, the insanity defense itself has any place in a criminal courtroom. You know, is the, is the law... It, Arthur? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just going to go <laughs> talk to a viewer named Gary from New York City. You want to talk to us, Gary? Yes. Uh, Good, good evening, Professor Miller. Evening. I've enjoyed watching you since the Constitution, that delicate balance in ethics in America. You're very kind to remember that. <laughs> uh, I wish I had more professors like you. My yeah. comment has to do with people taking self-responsibility, responsibility for their own actions. It's very similar to another person's comment. Uh, I was thinking more along the lines of cigarettes. You know, I choose to smoke cigarettes. If it kills me, it kills me. I have actually written into my will that my heirs are not allowed to sue. It's my choice to smoke them, and nobody else's. I have to take responsibility for that action. I just want to know what the rest of the panel thought about that. Well, I'd like to know if you sat on a jury recently or if your name's in the jury pool anywhere. No, uh, <laughs> Janine wants you to travel. Come to Westchester. <laughs> Excused. <laughs> Time for a break. We'll be back in uh, two minutes. This is me five years ago when I joined Pound Pinchers. And this is me now. For permanent fat loss, diets don't work. You need to build muscle. Before. <laughs> after. And the best way to do that is with the Soloflex rocket. No matter what shape you're in, you can rock your way to a slimmer figure and more muscle. So get on the rocket today and get on the road to permanent fat loss. The Soloflex rocket. Call now for a free brochure and video. To get a complete aerobic and muscle building workout, you could run and lift weights and cycle and climb stairs and lift weights and cycle and lift weights and climb stairs and cycle. Or you could just lay back and relax. Introducing the Soloflex Rocket, a total fitness machine that gives you an aerobic workout and builds muscle at the same time. 
and you can own it for less than you'd imagine. Call now for a free video and brochure. Hey kids, put on your hard hats and get ready for Real Life Giant Construction Equipment for Kids. The fun-filled video with 25 monster machines for only $4.95. Join Hard Hat Harry on a magical adventure to actual construction sites. 60 thrill-packed minutes of bruising bulldozers, colossal cranes, dirty dump trucks, and more. 25 big machines to watch over and over again. Asphalt eaters, pavers, rock crushers, all the heavy equipment kids love driving right into your living room. Real life giant construction equipment for kids is a rare chance to see huge excavators in action. Stone mountains blown up by dynamite. Kids even climb into the driver's seat of the big machines they love. Real life giant construction equipment for kids, originally sold for $19.95, is now only $4.95. And when you call, we'll also tell you about our free bonus video offer. So call now to order. We've just got enough time for a quick reaction. What's the future of all this, Janine? Hopefully the future is that people will recognize that these syndrome defenses don't have a lot of validity and they'll deal with the fact of whether or not a crime was committed and nothing more. There'll be more emphasis on personal responsibility, but that means the other side is when there is serious mental disorder, the juries will have to have sympathy and compassion for those who are truly weak. I think uh, the courts have to become more sophisticated uh, about w which experts they allow to testify and the basis for expert testimony. Mickey, a line or two about the future. I, I think that uh, people will be perhaps a little more skeptical, but things will calm down and be back to normal, and you will continue to have defenses such as this uh, throughout the rest of our lifetimes. So it's the uh, natural swing of the pendulum. It, it will all even out by the uh, general sanity of the juries. And it's time simply to say thanks, Mickey, Fred, George, Janine. Good night. Enjoy your favorite syndrome. And we'll be back <laughs> next week.